It's 10 miles. So they're opening the first half mile now in mid-November. Okay. And slowly inching its way towards the south. Hey, cool. So yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No. Are, oh, uh, online? But yes. <laughs> I have just allowed attendees to join. Great. So um, we are going to start in just five minutes. Cool. If you guys want to keep sharing your screen or you can pause it, just let me know. And I want to share. We can it's okay. Start now if you guys want to. I but will share the screen at least for a bit. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. Show the video. This is the video. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> um, should we wait a little bit, Nudia, or do you want to get started? I think. Um, we can get started now. Yeah. Great. You want to go ahead? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I see uh, Anne, Jean, how are you? Enrique, Kat. So we're showing, we're receiving you guys with a little introduction to the show, which is a video that contains the works of 20 artists that we're currently working for Vision Acuity, that is a hybrid exhibition. Um, actually, we're discussing a little bit what hybrid means in times of COVID. And mainly what we did with the exhibition was building a program that would allow people to have access <laughs> to the curatorial proposal, both online and on site, but it's complementary. So for those that have the opportunity to join us here at 7411 Biscayne Boulevard next to Vagabond Hotel at the Noxon Motel. You're gonna see that we managed to bring some of the pieces. Uh, due to COVID, mobility for art has changed as it has changed for people and financially and in many other ways. So we were trying to rethink how to give access to the curatorial proposal. That's basically what hybrid means. And we managed to put together a show with 20 artists and we invited people from New York, from Miami. It was very important for us to try to focus on local because somehow the physical portion of what we're doing is local and brings back local since everything has been fragmented so much due to the lack of mobility. Uh, we have someone from Iceland, Stigrimur Gauti. We have someone from Lebanon that is currently living and working between Miami and LA. That's uh, Sebastian Ejar. We have uh, Omar Barquette from Mexico. We have Andrea that is joining us here. She was in Paris and now she's in Chile. And you can see the full selection of artists and the proposal on our website. Um, this is a collaboration between the DSQ project which is a new uh, project that is aiming to complement that portion of the digital world and how to better serve exhibitions in order to approach them to those interested in them and also bring artists together to try to work around the constraints of showing online. And the other portion of the exhibition, uh, the, the other portion of the collaboration is with Clandestina which is a local Miami-based art project. Um, I am currently running Vision Acuity, and we have Ana Clara Silva with us. Mm -hmm. She is our curator. Uh, we have also Edward Holland joining us from New York. He is one of the 20 artists showing at Vision Acuity, and he is also showing in the physical portion of the exhibition. And we have Leo Castañeda, who is a local artist from Miami, and uh, he's showing both uh, online and in the physical portion. So you can see the painting of these artists, uh, the works of these artists that it's not only painting. Uh, it was an approach to painting initially, and that allows to start modifying the, uh, the narrative of what we did. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Ana Clara take it uh, over. Thank uh, you, Julia. Thank you so much. Presentation. <laughs> Uh, thank you, number one, to the DSQ project and to Clandestina for inviting me to participate in this. Um, when Nuria called me to work on the exhibition, she already had an idea for the artist that she wanted to introduce. Um, and then th this concept of vision acuity, we got into it and kind of broke it down and, 
and this is, you know, part of what the exhibition is all about, um, this collaboration. So thank you for inviting me and thank you to the artists who are here tonight to have this conversation with me. Um, we've been talking a little bit and it's already been so interesting. So I'm excited to see what comes out of it. Um, certainly, you know, talking about the pandemic is not something new. We've been talking about it for many, many months and talking about it within the context of the art world is not new either. We've all been dealing with it since the beginning and trying to find new ways to work and to work around it. Um, but I do think that each day that goes by and, and each month that goes by, we are in different stages of this thing. So it is always interesting to me to have this kind of conversation um, when we hit these new landmarks with right now with museums opening slowly, <laughs> galleries opening slowly, I do see that we're in this moment of, okay, how do we define this moment now and how do we move forward with it? Um, so the exhibition was really organized as this moment of reflection of where we are in October, 2020. And this is what we're here you know, to talk about today. Um, a lot of the works in the exhibition are focused on breaking down structure and dealing with issues of identity, memory of space, form, texture. And I think that once we speak with the artists that are here today, you're gonna to see um, how there are so many different ways to approach these ideas and how abstraction can lead us to breaking down the structure to understand or better understand what is going on right now. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the artists to talk a little bit about their work and so we can get acquainted with it and then we can go into a conversation about uh, some of the topics mm -hmm. that we all agree are, are issues that we're dealing with right now and, and we can open up the conversation to Q&A to everybody that's listening to. Um, Andrea, uh, <laughs> usually you're in Paris, right now you're in Chile's. I love that we have everybody from different places. Um, I'll turn it over to you first to talk about your work. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to share a screen uh, now, uh, if it's possible, uh, this one. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I am Andrea Rodriguez. I am a visual artist that is currently living in Paris. Um, I have chosen to develop my career on ceramics since uh, 2009. And in 2017, I decided to, to further my, expand my studies and training approach by participating in different art residencies, including one uh, big one in Holland, uh, another one in Berlin, and another one, uh, very challenging one in China. Um, and this really opened my, my, my eyes about how to combine like the traditional way of making ceramics with, uh, in a more contemporary way. Um, and I think, well, since the beginning of my career, uh, I seek to explore the traditional language based on the transformation of the clay and its products. And I usually engage with the context of, I mean, the different contexts of the, the localities in which I am uh, working, uh, responding sometimes to the environment, environmental crisis, uh, industrialization, uh, mass reproduction, all of those things. So uh, once, once I was uh, in Holland doing my residency, I got introduced to the CNC technology in which I could 3D print all my, my designs and then print molds and then do ceramics with that. And for me, that was really interesting because it was the first time that I could really do something that for me was more important and uh, different from what I was doing. Um, so what I'm showing you like really fast is uh, this is my first work I did with the 3D printing and uh, basically uh, it's a uh, this is a stoneware and uh, what I did is like I created a, a system of molds in which I could combine 27 different parts and then uh, I could uh, join them I combine them whatever, how I would like and then uh, I could, I could repeat, do the same repetition process of creating, 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 but all the pieces would be different. Um, so I really, really enjoyed doing this one. And uh, here is another one that I did when I was in China. This is a five meter times five meter installation that I did. And for this one, I use a pattern uh, inspired in the, um, 
symbology of uh, the pre-Columbian pre uh, pre symbology. Uh, so I wanted to make like a, 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 a exchange between uh, between what is like a symbology and also the contemporary way of mass reproductions nowadays and how that is like killing like all these uh, our like uh, our past uh, in a way in Chile at least. Um, and I wanted to show that in China because they didn't know anything about us, but they are the masters of reproduction. So in a way, I thought it would be like super interesting to do that. And uh, finally, well, really fast, this is like uh, the work I'm showing uh, now in this exhibition. And uh, this is like the same process of uh, doing this repetition, but in a way, uh, breaking the structure of the repetition by doing this different pattern in each piece square piece, very basic, but at the end, uh, I, I, I like to focus on the idea of the contrast of the uh, reproduction, like this also almost crazy reproduction that is, you can never stop it. I mean, you could do it one and one more and more and more and more, but then at the same time to give each piece one special uh, partic particularity in terms of I don't know, color or shape or, or whatever. So, well, um, that's like, a, now I am still like exploring uh, how to continue with this. I will start a, a, a other residency at Limoges and they are experts in 3D print, printing. So I am really looking forward to continue working with ceramics and making this uh, this relationship between ceramics and the technology that I really am really interested in that. that <laughs> thank you. So um, I will leave the... Uh, there you go. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. Leo, I think because Andrea used the word technology last in the end, I kind of want to go into you. The use of technology that's a complete, in a completely different way. But if you could talk about your work, please. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Anna, and th thanks, Nadia, for, for having us. Uh, and yeah, that was great to see Andrea's work and the way that it used traditional media in combination with technology, because I'm definitely into that, like to create feedback loops between uh, the digital and analog. Um, okay, so sharing screen. Oops, at the end of the portfolio, but. Um, so for the, for the last um, three years, about three years, I've been building a video game as an artwork uh, whose process started about 10 years ago. I'll get to some of those images, um, but just like combining the structures of video games with the structures of art of like creating like a series of paintings and drawings uh, to basically model the future virtual world. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start just showing some of the, Im the images that I've done lately of this video game. This is uh, one of the spaces. Uh, all the spaces are arranged uh, like uh, traditional, like 1990s video games where you go from one level to the next and they don't have any specific names. They're just called, so this is called level one. It's just a space like this like super uncertain space where you don't know what's liquid solid or gas um then this is uh actually actually i can show this in in movement this is the the current demo of the game that i've been able to do um for the last few months thanks to a grant from ulight and locust projects uh, i was able to work with a programmer the last few months and so um, uh, here you can kind of see, I mean, it's still kind of glitchy because it's still in process, but, but this is how the video game kind of works spatially. Uh, so this is that same environment from the screenshot, but in a more interactive way. Uh, yeah, and, and in, in the game, I'm really trying to like explore like what the structures of interactions and in games are, what the structures of power 
in, in the game, uh, sorry, sorry, in like the, in the world or in games are, so yeah, in this level, like the, the player is completely <laughs> powerless in this world, they can turn liquid solid or gas. Um, and then let me fast forward a little bit because we have limited time. Um, here, uh, you can kind of see the, the different abilities that uh, the game has. Like, I really want to play with with abilities that are not traditional to video games. So, like, not necessarily going around and like hitting things. <laughs> so, uh, for, so I've uh, come up with a system where where you use intensity to intensify actions. So, or have like a basic action. So, in this room, you see how. Uh, you can use touch, and then if I fast forward a little bit, you can intensify touch to punch things and destabilize them. So use use touch to stabilize. Um, also, um, yeah, I, I, I've been uh, like really trying to figure out like what the the character essence of like a future video game would be that's beyond just like like a male and female binary. So this character. Uh, is like you don't know if it's like an alien or an android or or what it is, but uh, it like it can basically like adapt skins to its environment and and uh, yeah and that there's different actions that happen through those adaptations. Um, yeah, such as like if you look at this sculptural rock <laughs> for a while, then you can absorb the the texture from there and then. Like a passage opens up, and um, yeah. really the thing that is back here is it a similar? Yeah, yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I'm I'm gonna stop the video so I can get to other things. Um, one second. Um, where, where's the pause button? But but anyways, um, the the process of getting to this game is a feedback loop of digital to analog. So um, yeah, here's another image from the game. But it all kind of started in 2009 when I started making paintings based on uh, video game worlds. The painting that's behind you, yes, that's directly this character uh, from the video game. But I, I was just experimenting with placing them in, into this kind of like hybrid interior and exterior space. So it would kind of be like inside of a living room, but then there would be like this outside space. Um, I, I designed this painting before COVID, but as COVID started happening, uh, and and then you know like the this kind of character started becoming more like like a, someone in a protective suit or something. Then it kind of started changing context a little bit. Uh, but but I mean that's for me. Like it, it depends on how. Uh, it's read for anyone else but, but yeah so basically this is a painting that started it uh, like 10 years ago and i've been doing collages of digital to analog uh for for a long time uh, this is like some of the exhibitions that i've been uh planning that, that would be like dream exhibitions to like combine video game booths with uh art installations so you have like basically all mediums uh merging together into a space and these are some uh, earlier experiments and working across different media. So like this is a painting and in conjunction with a sculpture where you can see through it and you have like a virtual world. Or uh, here's another uh, experiment where you would look through a headset and then there was a whole little mech head including the space that where where the um, this painting was in. And yeah, and here as well th that I was designing like a lot of like furniture pieces for accessing virtual worlds. Um, so the, the the paintings in the show are kind of subsets of these two kind of like joint series, like this series where it's kind of like feedback loops of, uh, of, uh, of uh, photos of the virtual spaces where I put textures from paintings and it's kind of, yeah, like endless loop of, of media and um, and, and yeah, just like remnants of the character designs and, and the whole process of creating these virtual spaces and these games. There's another piece that's in the show that is uh, a texture from one of, yeah, a texture that I use inside the video game. And this is a, another piece that is another virtual space uh, 
the actually the same virtual space as here. Like you can kind of see this little cube here with lines. That's the same object that then create, created this painting. But yeah, that's that's a short summary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Edward, you're next. If you could please share some images of you also. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn to share with the class? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Soon we'll get more flowy with conversation. I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. To have an idea of, of the work, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so I am decidedly less uh, tech savvy, perhaps in conjunction with Andrea Leo's work. But I, I'm a painter. I work on paper or canvas. Uh, it's very uh, collage based. Um, but what's interesting is that listen to the other two artists talk is that they deal with what I think inherent sets of limitations. And I think that ultimately that's what my work is about is sort of creating these limitations and then exploring what's possible in painting through these limitations. And I'm a series based artist. So I sort of pick one thing I'm interested in, create sort of a framework and then every painting work on paper that's a result of that series deals with these sort of same sets of limitations. Since 2014, I've been working um, with a series of paintings that deals with the Zodiac, but less about astrology and more about this idea that the Zodiac that we know was at one time <laughs> in history used to explain a culture's morals, a culture's history, a culture's religion, and that the zodiac and the constellations sort of had a narrative that was supposed to sort of educate somebody but essentially it was an abstract shape it was a picture that was doing the educating and it was an art you know gobbledygook it's it's a signifier right the it, the constellation is a signifier for a narrative and so i kind of liked that spillover into painting itself that a painting is a signifier for a narrative it tells a, a culture's history or it is meant to give stories from the bible or any any of these other things that painting essentially used to do but now in our present culture painting people don't learn the bible by looking at a cycle of paintings and people don't understand what the zodiac really was or those stories and so i liked that destruction of initial intent and now they're both sort of considered obsolete in a way i mean a lot of people talk about the death of painting you know i don't think that's true i love painting i like i think painting's romantic and so i kind of make these paintings not ironically but sort of as you know something that i am actively engaged in but so when you look at these and hopefully i'm sharing my screen um the constellation each painting or work on paper has a constellation embedded in the actual image. And they're usually signified by these little X's. And so this actually happens to be Sagittarius. Um, each painting or work on paper is titled by a more common name. So this is called the Archer. And right now I'm up to at least 15 different versions. And so these limitations that happen are that I have to have the constellation in each and every painting. And so sometimes it's very apparent. You see the constellation, you know it's there. Other times it's a little bit more obscured or other times it's very obscured. And then I have, that it's sort of about, well, making something unique and interesting that still deals with these limitations. The collage uh, allows me to build up uh, a surface and build up the composition and deal with the idea and the language of painting, its color, its shape, its texture, but not actually having to use paint. It, it's very freeing. I think collage, you can sort of work in a subconscious way a lot of the time, or at least I do. And so I build up the composition first with collage and then go into the actual painting. Um, all of these works that I'm sharing with you now are in the show, either online or in person. Um, and as you can see, some are a lot more opaque in, in what they're after, and other times it's a little bit more obvious. I will say that all of the color choices, all of the collage choices are informed by whatever that sign happens to be. So for instance, um, uh, like 
on this one, on the painting that's in the show, this is actually Pisces, which is the fish. So there's little bits of fish in here. Um, Pisces happens to rule the hand. And so some of the collage elements deal with hands. There is usually the color choices. Pisces color is traditionally green. And so I have more of the sort of aquamarine, sort of turquoisey green, plus the yellow and blue that make that green. And so I try to filter decisions for the painting through the sign as much as possible or through the myth itself. And that, again, acts as this limitation that I have to react against. And so while the painting process itself is very intuitive, I'm sort of I'm very consciously creating a space wherein I get to be intuitive. Because once that space is created, then I can just sort of have fun. But I need to make sure that the space I set up initially allows for that freedom of expression. And part of that is research and part of that is just going through the paces of making a hundred of these. Because at a certain point, I mean, I'm sure Andrea and Leo will agree, you know, you, you sort of, you go after something with what you think is the original idea and very quickly it becomes about something else. You know, I thought these paintings were gonna be about mythology and sort of the destruction of uh, intent with, signifiers and all these sort of high-minded ideals, but it, it, that wasn't what these were supposed to be about. These ended up being much more expressive. They ended up being much more about paint and the physicality of paint and actually the process. They became much more process-based paintings than anything else. And so the good news is, is that, you know, I've been working on this series for six years and I still don't feel bored with it. I think there's still a lot of um, territory there between the just having this loose framework of having to have a zodiac sign in each and every piece that's enough to keep me interested and engaged and so that's where I am now thank you thank you guys I think it's so cool to see um, three artists working with different mediums working with various mediums and and talking about breaking down kind of the material and, and form in so many different ways and to be able to then work together, you know, to talk about these things. But um, I do want to get into a little bit more of a conversation around this year and how it's affected uh, production of work and exhibition of work. Um, in particular, I wanted to open up with the difficulties and the challenges um, and kind of where we are now, because with the, with the different mediums that you guys are working with, there are different challenges, right? And, and what's been happening since March. Um, be it delayed exhibitions, canceled residencies, um, or in Andrea's case that she was telling us earlier, um, actually being able to work with ceramic and having ceramics and having to go to a studio and work with ceramics, what happened then and what happened and where are you now? Like what has changed in the past eight months um, with you being able to produce the work? Oh, you're still on mute. Uh, there you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, working with ceramics is a full-time challenge. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, a, I mean, COVID made a difference, but I am always like challenging of how to move the work from one place to another, how to fire it, how to, I, I need a lot of space. Uh, so I think that the worst part of COVID was that I couldn't really do anything while I was at home because I couldn't go to the studio. Because if I did something in the studio, then I had to move it and moving it and it breaks because it's not fire. So then it's like, okay, I can't do anything by like work on the computer, do some maybe 3D designs, but it's not what I like. I like to touch the clay and I want to do things. But it has been always like that. I mean, uh, I mean, always I need a, when I, when I arrived to Paris, I needed to find a studio to work. And in between, I couldn't work. That's the problem with, with the type of technique I, but uh, one of the bad things, uh, I think in the, the exhibition area, I mean, concerning exhibitions, at least for the type of work that I do is that there's a lot that is missing uh, about the texture, the details, the, the, the you know, like touching or, or, or the physical like uh, approach to the art work. In my case, it's uh, even though you make like amazing pictures or like really good quality pictures, 
there's something that you will never be able to 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 like uh, to visualize uh, of course. but uh, i mean that's how it is and um <laughs> i i had a i had a residency council yes uh, i had a, an exhibition in china council yes yes <laughs> po postponed yes my life was postponed like six months but yes here yeah. we are <laughs> yeah and how about you guys leo edward and you like particular experiences of, of the difficulties or challenges of producing artwork during this time? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, I, I don't have the same challenges that Andrea has. You know, I actually found that, again, speaking about limitations, I kind of enjoyed the limitations that happened you know, when this first hit New York, uh, my family and I decided to get out of New York and we went up to Vermont and spent two months with my parents up there. And I was able, I grabbed literally, literally just an armful of materials and just packed it into a bag and we left. And so I treated it almost like as a challenge. And I made a series of collages based off of all the things that I could scrounge up between here and my mom happens to be a very fabulous painter. And so she had lots of materials there. And so I was able to sort of make it work and then came back to New York for a little bit. Then we went to North Carolina where my in-laws are and it was the same thing, grab a bunch of things. And so I kept sort of having these limitations and I kind of liked the challenge of having to deal with these limitations. And so it, it sort of helped me break out of the sort of routine and the monotony of the studio and where I was in my work. And that'll take time to sort of figure out what that means ultimately. But something it, that I was interested in too is, is there's these challenges and the difficulties, but what is the part that's coming out of it that we can appreciate and say, Oh, yeah. I, and look, I mean, will I, you know, will this ever be any good? Who knows? But it was sort of like, this is the COVID period. And this is sort of trying to figure out just sort of putting things and dealing with things and figure out what long term effects it has. Uh, but I will say that, you know, unfortunately, Andrea had a situation where stuff was canceled. As a painter, with the ease of being able to put something up digitally, I actually had maybe more group shows thrown my way and more opportunities thrown my way because they were exclusively digital. And if you have a good image of a painting, it still looks relatively good on screen. And so I think that there were some things that were positive that came out of it all. You know, I think that ultimately the biggest negative was that sort of insular hermetic experience of not seeing art in person, not seeing fellow artists, not having that camaraderie. I think that was stifling, but as a whole, I think that, you know, I tried to make the most of these challenges sure. in a way that I could. Sure. Leo? Uh, yeah, yeah. For, for me, it was overall a, a good experience. Like I think I, I, was, I had put off the video game project or like fully focusing on it for a while. So the first few months of COVID, I barely went to the studio and I was just on the computer. <laughs> uh, so, so I think it, it was good to, Oh no, you froze. The things that I was able to do. Yeah. Oh, did you freeze? Did I freeze? Did I yep. freeze? You're back. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, wait, let me just shut off the internet on the nearby devices. Um, but but yeah, so I was able to kind of like narrow the amount of things that I could do, and I think it was it was good to to focus because I, I had put off uh, focusing on that project for a while, and then slowly as things became more familiar. I can't say that they thought better because <laughs> Miami hasn't handled it in the best way, but uh, but at least more familiar. Um, yeah, I started going back to the studio and painting a little bit more. Uh, I, I think it's been more like a, like a financial strategy time. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, uh, I have X amount of months saved up and I know that this exhibit got canceled and I know that these freelance jobs got canceled. Like, yeah. all right, how to use yeah, like uh, I haven't experienced that uh, as much before uh, as far as like trying as, yeah, like applying to a lot of grants or applying to a lot of things and like trying to to do a, a lot of things at the same, yeah, a lot of like financial streams at the same time yeah. while also having like less things to do. Um, but, but yeah, but overall it's been, I think, very, very growthful and I feel very lucky and and I feel lucky that eventually some of those uh, pandemic packages 
uh, started coming in, even though they've been better in other countries, uh, at least after like a few months of, of trying hard to apply for unemployment, like that kicked in a little bit in, yeah. in, in, in the summer. And that was, <laughs> so that felt a little bit like, like being one of those little airplanes. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and since I started working with a programmer, also like I had to, yeah, I had to pay him. So, yeah. so my, my costs, uh, my production costs went up. So it was like a nice way of balancing that out. But um, it's been interesting to see. I don't, I don't know how in other cities, how it's been um, but locally, how um, different institutions have helped artists, but then also how artists have helped the public period. You know, um, there was the Sunny Project here in Miami where photographs were sold. Um, they raised a lot, I mean, they raised like over some, over $50,000 for different um, wow. nonprofits and organizations to help in different areas, you know, not in the arts. So I thought that was interesting to see how that all came together. I wanted to ask the, the two that are not from Miami, what you saw in terms of the art community coming together to help during this time or the kind of help that you received as an artist um, from different organizations or government help, depending what country you're from. Uh, Edward? Well, I think New York has such a large population of artists living here that are certainly plugged in and there's a lot of resources and organizations dedicated to sort of keeping artists solvent and afloat and able to make work. And so there was a lot of outreach from them. There was a lot of sort of community building at the grassroots level by artists. And so what I, I I was in a fortunate situation and I still continue to feel that I was in a fortunate situation. You know, what I noticed in New York though, was that it was more, it was all still tied to, at the same time COVID was really bad in New York, was also the same time that the Black Lives Matter protests were really kicking into high gear in New York. And so a lot of art outreach and efforts to promote artists and to help artists were also tied into protest movements mm -hmm. and so there was a lot a lot of cross-pollination on those fronts and in new york i think that that's where a lot of people were focused at that moment was well yeah it's a tricky situation for these people in for the artists in new york but we're more concerned right now about protesting and getting the word out about these other issues and so I think a lot of energy actually went into that more so than almost anything else. That's interesting it's so true here too and, and I think everywhere at least in the United States when everything was happening it was like okay where do we focus this kind of help that we can do for each other right? Yeah and I think that was the biggest takeaway is that all of a sudden you know it, it was this, it's this weird disruption between you're at home, you're by yourself or with your family. If you're making work, you're in your studio by yourself. You're not seeing people. You're only communicating digitally or via like FaceTime or something. But at the same time, you're still plugged into these activist groups or these artist groups to, to uh, facilitate some kind of sense of community. So it was this weird disruption between being a part of a community, but still feeling very isolated. Yeah, of course, of course. Andrea, I'm sure that in France, it works differently than it does here um, in terms of support from governments. And yeah. you mentioned that there was a, I forget what you, what exactly what it was called, but. Uh, was, the labor uh, union, I think it's called in a, it's like a syndic, uh, oh, the syndic. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, because everything there works like in that way. Like if you're an artisan, you are, you are part of the artisans syndicate. If you're an artist, you are from that. If you're a, a chef, you are from the, uh, I mean, it depends of, of the area and where, I mean, which, which you work. Mm -hmm. But it also depends of, 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 of taxes, like if you're, a, if you're currently working as an artist, if you are receiving an income and you're paying your taxes and you are declaring everything, what the government did was like, okay, you, how much money were you supposed to be winning, earning at this moment? So for instance, okay, in March last year, that to not to, uh, okay, uh, they say, okay, for example, of 1,000 euros. So then they pay you what they, 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 they the moment where we were like in the lockdown, mm -hmm. they paid the, the amount of money that you were supposed to be receiving, but you're not because you're not able to work. 
But as I say, only it works if you are an artist and you are declaring and you are like paying your taxes. And it works like that. If you are not in the system, then you are nobody. And it's okay. I mean, I understand that, but but in a in a way, it's like a, I was just starting. Um, I was not a really really part of anything at the moment where the, when the COVID started, so I couldn't like ask for any type of help, mm -hmm. and I didn't really get to try to find other ways because I think that. Uh, at that period, uh, I was so stressed about like just being locked down that I, yeah. I didn't realize. But but then I understood like uh, there were a lot of artists that did receive uh, government support uh, mm -hmm. for like uh, two or three months, uh, and it was really good. Um, in Chile, on the other hand, it was really different because uh, yeah, the support there was barely nothing. I mm -hmm. mean, it was uh, really. I don't know, maybe because uh, France is a very rich, rich country and everybody focus, was focusing on Europe when the COVID started and yeah, France yeah. was there and Spain and everybody liked it to news and everything was like, what is happening in France and Spain and yeah. Italy? And then they couldn't say like, okay, artists go away. <laughs> I mean, I think that the social pressure was too hard. But then in Chile, it's such a small country, like so far away that I, nobody was really paying attention. So. I think that the social pressure was also low. It was interesting. I remember the, towards like March and April, it was interesting to see how countries in Europe were reacting to the cultural sector yeah. and the support that they were providing for the culture sector and then almost wanting the United States to follow, to follow suit with that. And clearly that's, that was not the case. Um, but that's, you know, a whole other conversation. Um, so I was going to leave the Q&A till later, but our good friend Javier Hernandez actually posted a question that um, leads into the next topic that I wanted to cover. And it's about um, seeing artwork in person and then seeing artwork online and, and, and what the hell that means. Um, I'm going to read it because he, he wrote it pretty well and interestingly. Um, he said, seeing these varied methods of working brings to mind the idea of the ways we physically see work versus the virtual experience. There's an obvious more social aspects of visiting a gallery, museum, or artist studio, but I can see how something like Leo's work can offer a social experience in viewing art. How do you feel about the difference in the experience of seeing art in social video game interface compared, to, uh, compared with the more traditional art event? Should we try to make them as similar an experience as possible? So Leo, I'll let you take that one just because of this uh, specific geared towards this video game interface. Um, yeah, I think that's been one of the positive aspects of, of COVID is that it's accelerated um, like well, within, within fine art, within the visual arts, like the, the online hybrid component as seen in the, this exhibit. Um, because I feel like, yeah, like video games, for example, have barely felt the, the COVID pressure. Like they've actually increased, uh, like video game uh, distribution and sales have increased by, I don't know what percentage, like during COVID times since people are locked in. And I think the, the, the visual arts or fine art has, as much as we have Instagram and Facebook and, uh, and websites that are very fortunately like providing online platforms that we do have a little bit of a limitation when it comes to reaching the, the masses that I think is uh, worthwhile to, to understand from video games and music and other media, mm -hmm. especially if the, the ideas that are found within art can be so relevant to, to share, <laughs> to share, you know, like, uh, and, and um, yeah, so I think uh, adapting some of the distribution platforms of video games, which to, in a way are a little bit like the distribu distribution platforms of film like Netflix or Spotify. Like I think uh, figuring out a way to, to create a, that hybrid approach where you have works that are accessible for, for a wider audience could be interesting to figure out in the future. And it's not, not a requirement, like it's so beautiful to be able to do art for a few people or, for, or personally, but, but I do think that uh, the, the impact of art coming forward, like starting now and going forward could, could become more significant as we figure out ways to go beyond just the, the singular object inside of a singular space. Um, so, sure. so mm -hmm. to me, it's been crazy to see, you know, if I missed a lecture at a museum before, 
would take mm -hmm. months for that lecture to pop up online on their website, if mm -hmm. it ever even popped up. And now with what we're doing tonight, even, um, you have access to so many talks and lectures and images that we didn't have access to before. Um, collections, you, or even market-wise, uh, price-wise, you know, you get access to all of this that before we didn't have as much access. Um, but going back to the physicality of the work, um, Andrea had mentioned that seeing the sculpture in her case is, and Edward mentioned that putting a, an image of the painting, it does, it feels like you have access in that way and you can see the painting, but a lot of the times a sculpture, it's so much about moving around the work and seeing it from different angles and, and, and the impact in that way. Um, so I wonder how you feel about digital exhibitions, um, both Edward and Andrea, and the importance of having the physical space too, which then I wanted to ask Nuria a little bit about in terms of this hybridity of having a partial viewing, a space to meet, a space to look at artwork, but then continuing and opening the platform through the physical space to go into the digital space. Um, what do you guys, how do you guys feel about it? I feel like so many people feel the same way. Obviously there's the aura of the artwork in person, but where are you in terms of how we move forward with uh, digital exhibitions, partial exhibitions? <laughs> I'm really, in a way, um, I, I, I mean, yeah, it's not the ideal, but in a way I'm really enthusiastic with this new way of showing art because I know there's a lot of people that not, are not really interested in going to a gallery or getting into a museum or or they are lazy or they, they were so busy that they didn't have time or the, the openings of I mean, are not like the, right like with the schedule of the people or the audience. So in a way, this new digital way of showing art, it's open to everybody. Mm -hmm. Like uh, anybody can see a show, everybody, not anybody, everybody can see a show that doesn't matter which time uh, laying in bed or like eating something, breakfast or whatever, you, you don't have to move. <laughs> and in a way that's good because, yeah, you can show your work to more people because uh, when, for example, when you went to a gallery, the only way to see the exhibition was going to the gallery or going to right. the museum. But now you have this, this virtual visits that mm -hmm. all the galleries are making and the catalogs and the, uh, they're doing all these transformations and then you don't even know, you don't even have to go there. I mean, of course it's better to go, but in a way it now it's like, I feel like now art is for everybody. Mm -hmm. I felt, I enough. think that before it was like, art was like for art, <laughs> artists, I don't know. Now it's for everybody. And uh, I really appreciate that. I think that's a good part of all of this, even though, I would really like to touch things and experience <laughs> it like uh, alive there. But of course, I, I like the, the, yeah. the new way. That, I mean, it's, it's okay. I feel it's and okay. Edward, you mentioned that you've been getting a lot of digital shows and, and how have you seen the reception of those digital shows compared to when you're like, hey, friends and family come to this gallery opening and you see them that night and whatever. Yeah. How, how has that reaction been with the people that usually interact with your work? Well, I just, I, I have so many conflicted feelings about it all. You know, ultimately, people have been used to looking at art as a JPEG for 20 years, right? I mean, this isn't new. And I think that if you know an artist's work, you can look at the JPEG and have a sense as to what the physicality of the paint is and sort of what it's like in person. And you can sort of approximate it. And so it's not that big of a difference now with all the online shows and if you're art savvy with a particular artist or you know how to sort of navigate these channels then I, I don't think you've noticed that much of a of a difference I don't I feel like you if anything there's just more but I mm -hmm. think that that more aspect I think is the biggest side effect of all of this mm -hmm. is that there's just been every artist myself included every collector I know every curator they're just bombarded with yeah. online offerings and online shows and digital this and digital that and while that's great and it does democratize the art world and it increases transparency with published prices which I fully support yeah I think that whereas being an artist at least in New York felt a lot of times like shouting into the wind now it really feels like shouting into the mm -hmm. wind 
based off of the amount of online activity that's happening. And while that's great, I, I don't know if it's a negative or a positive. I think this is just the natural extension of how the market is growing and how people are taking in all this information. And so I think that to Leo's point, I think that looking at just the ways in these methods of distribution is a great thing. And I think that people that are really much smarter than I am are way ahead of this and trying to anticipate where these things will go. I just found that from my own experience is that, you know, I had, I put a lot of work into the surface of the painting and I put a lot of work into the way you treat it when you're there physically. Mm -hmm. And I am not the biggest fan of how you lose that intimacy when you look at it online. And I am not, I still feel overwhelmed by the amount of online shows that I see and are sort of drawn attention to. And I feel guilty having to do the same thing to, to you and to Nuria and like, and, and so it's sort of like, I'm all for it, but I still have this reserve about it. I'm, you know, it's like, so I don't really know how to answer the question ultimately. It's just because I, I support certain aspects of it, but there's also, I long to just have a painting in a gallery and to sit there yeah. and be with it. And I think that true collectors, true supporters long for that thing too, and they will go back to it. And mm -hmm. so I think the hope is that for the democracy, for the all the new collectors and the new curators and the people that are interested it's then providing systems in places where they can then get that experience too because that's where you jump the level right that's where you get to that next point of understanding an artist's work and understanding the role of the gallery and the museum and the institution of course and, and nudi i wanted to talk to you about this because it's something that you know you've been organizing exhibitions for so long and now navigating it this way. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it. I'm gonna wrap it up very fast because I know everyone wants to see the debate. Um, ah. <laughs> I think, I do agree. There's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot that has happened this year and it was very fast. So I think at the beginning, we were not even realizing how we were gonna get impacted as a group. I'm talking specifically about art artists and those who dedicate their lives to do this. Now that things are settling and it's turning into a normal rhythm, then we're trying to grab what's next. Um, I think that it's very important, something that Edward mentioned, that I've seen more prices being shown in public especially to art fairs that are running right now uh, online. Mm -hmm. I think there is also a lot less noise that had to do with social life, which I like, you know, art is festive, like that portion of art is very, very festive, but there was a lot of messages that got lost in something like our Basel, freeze. I remember going to six art fairs in four months and being totally exhausted and being the same people. And I think that the, this has created a, or tried to create a way to allocate resources towards artists in a different way. Mm -hmm. Therefore, carry that um, effort to what a collection can potentially look. Because we're talking that right now, we were able to put together a show that even though it's hybrid, meaning that not all the pieces are there in person and we have not that enjoyment. Like I would have loved to have Andrea's pieces there in person, <laughs> the texture, the feel like I wanna, I wanna know, you know, and being yeah. part of a gallery, you, you always touch them. <laughs> like you're not supposed no. to. <laughs> I mean, no, we don't yeah. touch them. We make them float to the wall. <laughs> awesome. um, I miss that, but I think that we have the chance to give collectors a better option in regards of how they approach art mm -hmm. and which artists they can include in their collections. And something that happened with this exhibition is that uh, I had a study artist for months, uh, many of which I didn't know in person. And I sit down and I went through all these things and I approached them with 
a lot of discretion with this idea and this project and I had a very good response and then I carried that to you and like you know you completed that curatorial portion mm -hmm. but it's more expansive because now all these 20 artists have carried the message of the other ones Absolutely. they are all great artists like their ability their curriculum what they're doing right now it's very impressive maybe this would have not happened before maybe the prices would not have been shown like this and i think that it's important because it's going to change the way that we put together collections and it's going to change the way that we do business for sure in art and that's extremely important for artists so uh i i want to thank you all like all the artists the ones that are connected the ones that are here for being part of this effort and i think that both the DSQ project and all the people involved in this clandestina the Bagaman hotel are extremely thankful and look forward to see what's going to come after this as a result and obviously i want to invite everyone that can safely visit the show mm -hmm. to do it so uh basically at 7411 biscayne boulevard and just please let us know if you want more information about the works. We have photos of all every possible angle. <laughs> <laughs> or we have videos we have. It's we know we need that experience, you know. We have videos at night, we had it in the middle of the day because the light. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was a way that we could give people access to the gallery space during the whole day just to have that. Like you have a photo in the background that is like in the middle of the day. And you know that when we are there in the evening, it's just such a different experience. I know. Of course, of course, with these works in, in particular. But, and I think it's cool, you had mentioned this earlier with our conversation, the physical space allows us a place to congregate and talk about these things and like invite people and look at some of the work. But then the way that you incorporated the QR codes throughout the gallery so that you can then see the whole narrative and see the rest of the works that are part of the exhibition. That's exciting. I've never, I don't know if I've seen that before, you know, like you're there and then you can interact in this, in this way digitally. So it, it works for me. I like it. <laughs> it's been fun to solve that with the artists and I yeah. don't know, maybe we're going to complement this with other, uh, I guess for the program, there's part of the program that people can visit even when the gallery is closed. There's a uh, on-site intervention by uh, Monica Bravo that people can see it from the street. Because also the other thing that the high ritual allowed us is what Andrea said, it's the people that for whatever reason don't wanna go, don't need to go out, mm -hmm. they have access through this. But there's also people that are starting to mobilize themselves around the city. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, these are projects that they can see from the outside or, or people that simply they don't want to get inside a gallery. When I was a nurse student, I was totally panicked you get nervous when you start oh, going to the art yeah you get it's, you're hesitant you know you don't know who's there yeah. if you're invited if it's allowed uh, for whatever reason but that's definitely a yeah, reality you know for people who are not already directly involved so that part a uh, 100 percent, i think is a, a positive thing to come out of this is the access access for everyone but, yeah yeah awesome. well i don't know if there's any more q a um I've, I've been trying to help. No, there's no, not any Q&A, but it seems like everyone liked it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's a good thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Thank you guys. It's it's somehow already nine o'clock. Um, time to wrap it up, but yeah. I feel Thank good. you so much to everyone. And I hope you come visit the show in person. Thank yeah. you. Thanks Thank you. for the invitation. Thank you for having us. Bye guys. Very nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.